My name is Chris McKay. I'm a planetary scientist at NASA Ames Research Center and my research focuses on search for life on Mars and working in places on Earth that are analogs for Mars from the point of view of astrobiology. In the FMARS expedition, the four-month expedition in the Arctic, my role was as the PI of the science proposal that went into the Polar Continental Shelf Project uh, that define the science that the crew would do while they're here. And as part of the science advisory group, I've been working with the crew to get that science implemented and to make sure the crew has the science tools they need and has a plan for doing research that will result in what we hope will be some important and publishable uh, results. Well, the, Mar the Mars Society is, in a sense, an outgrowth of a series of projects that were called the Case for Mars that started at the University of Colorado when I was a graduate student there. And the idea was to uh, investigate Mars from a biological point of view, and it was clear that human exploration was an important part of that. Uh, and Robert Zubrin, who was part of those Case for Mars conferences, then uh, formed the Mars Society, and I've been to all of their conventions. I've been a founding member and a supporter of it, I think. It, as it's turned out, the Mars Society's main contribution, in my view, is to provide a place where particularly students who are interested in space exploration and Mars exploration can get involved. It provides a way for them to join up with others that are interested, both professionals and non-professionals, space professionals, and to work on projects like FMARS and the Mars Desert Research Station in Utah that are making meaningful contributions to the human exploration of space. And so I, I think it's this educational and training role is particularly important. In addition, these simulations do provide useful technical data about how to best explore Mars with humans. Devon, Devon Island, where the FMARS hab is, is a particularly interesting analog for Mars studies because first, from a geological perspective, there's a large crater here, an impact crater. Uh, there's a lot of features here that are associated with impact processes, which of course dominate Mars. In addition, because it's an Arctic desert, ecologically the environment here is very interesting from the point of view of comparing life on Mars and searching for life on Mars. For example, looking at how organisms are preserved in the permafrost, looking at how life survives under cold and dry conditions. All of this gives us ways to better understand how life could have survived on Mars and how evidence for that life could be preserved. NASA is planning to send humans to the moon and Mars. Right now, the main work is focusing on building the spacecraft, the Ares and Orion vehicles that will take them there. But we need also to be focusing on what are they going to do when they get there? What are, we, what are we going to do on the moon and Mars? And the answer really is science, field exploration. We need to learn how to do that. And by doing these sorts of simulations and explorations in environments on Earth that are like the moon and Mars, we can develop trained personnel and protocols and equipment that will be useful when it comes to doing the same sort of thing on the Moon and Mars. One of the nice things about analog research is that many of the interesting Mars analog sites are scattered throughout the world, Canada, Chile, Antarctica, and so it becomes intrinsically an international scientific project to explore and work in these analogs. For example, here on Devon Island right now, as I'm speaking, there are scientists from Canada, from the United States, from many other countries, from Europe, uh, South America, all working together to understand the setting here. Similarly, when we work in the Atacama Desert in Chile or in the Antarctic, the crews are necessarily international. And I think that's going to build up a scientific network that's going to extend to international cooperation on the Moon and international cooperation on Mars. So we're not just preparing ourselves from an engineering and science point of view, but in a sense we're preparing ourselves also for an international cooperation point of view with these analog sites. One of, the, one of the things the crew is doing here is experimenting with going on Mars time. Mars day is about a half an hour longer than the Earth day, which means that when there's a crew on Mars, they're not going to be in sync with ground control on Earth, and in fact, even more so, their day is going to shift. So about every uh, 24 days or so, uh, they'll be half, they'll be exactly out of phase, and then another 24 days they'll get back in phase, and so on. And 
that's going to have some interesting implications for how that crew interacts with with uh, scientists on Earth and, and mission control on Earth. It also has some interesting implications for how that crew would adjust. Will humans who spent essentially all of their evolutionary history in a 24-hour day be able to work effectively in a 24 and a half hour day? It, it doesn't sound like a big difference, just a half an hour a day. But different people respond differently. Some people have a very hard time when we go from uh, daylight savings to standard time and back again. And that may be an example of the sort of problem we might have with the crew. So I think it's very important before we send humans to Mars to understand what the potential issues are so that we can be prepared to mitigate them and work, work around them. Unfortunately, though, it's very hard to simulate a, a Mars cycle uh, because Earth has a naturally 24-hour cycle. So you could put people in a, in a laboratory and set the clocks and the, and the uh, lights so that lights came on and off, but then they're, they're going to be confined. Uh, they're not going to be able to go out and do real meaningful jobs. Uh, it's going to be an artificial experiment, and the results won't necessarily be valid. If you put them outside, then they'll see the natural day and night cycle of Earth time, and it won't be a very good simulation either. The polar regions in the summer provide actually an ideal way to do the experiment because with 24 hours of sunlight you can define when and how long the photo period is however you'd like. So the crew here has come up with a system where they define their day uh, to be based on a Mars clock and then they close up the hab during their Mars night and then the day they open up the hab and of course the sun's shining and they get all the cues that indicate daytime. And so this provides probably the best simulation uh, possible of a Mars clock and Mars time. And because all the crew is doing it, there's no external constraints within their environment that tells them that they're off sync. So their entire environment, their entire world here in the HAB is moving over to Mars time. And so all the social clues move with them. And with the sun clues, uh, with, the, with the 24 hours of sunlight, they're able to work the the light cues as well. So I think this is a very important and novel research component of the, of the stay here. And, and in fact, I would predict that it's probably going to be the most important result of the four-month expedition. There will be other scientific results that will be important too, but those kind of results could have been duplicated by a crew up here just doing regular research, a regular geology or limnology team. And in fact, the research that we're doing in the permafrost is similar to the research that other teams are doing in the Arctic that aren't doing Mars simulations. But the Mars time is something that could really only be done here, can only be done in a hab like this, it can only be done with a crew that's dedicated to exploring that aspect of the human experience on another world. So I'm very excited about that and I think it's going to be a, uh, a study that will be long remembered uh, for being the first really comprehensive and technically accurate study of what a crew needs to do to be able to function on, on Mars time.